Stand, please, as the family enters. You may be seated. Worship was and is a big part of the Stafford family. And one of the things that, uh, that we're going to do today in our service as we remember and honor Bill uh, is to engage in a bit of worship ourselves. And so we're going to have congregational singing today. We want to encourage you, if you wouldn't mind, uh, there are songbooks there uh, in front of you on the back of the pew. I'd encourage you to secure one of those and open it to number 226, please. Two, two, six. Oh, my God. 
Number 36, please. We have gathered here today to honor the life and memory of William H. Stafford, who was born on December 6th, 1940, in Columbus, Indiana, and passed to his reward on January 13th, 2022, at the age of 81 years, one month, and seven days. Bill was preceded in death by his parents, William and Dorothy Stafford, and one sister, Dolores. 
He's survived by his beloved wife of 57 years, Tico, a brother, Robert, daughter, Barbara, son, Bill, and his wife, Donette, and son, Kenny, and his wife, Amy, and survived by two grandsons, Wyatt and Will. Not long after Bill was born, his parents moved the family to Dallas, where Bill attended and graduated from Woodrow Wilson High School, and then after that, North Lake College. And Bill served our country uh, in the military for 24 years. His first two years in the Marine Corps, and then 22 years in the Air Force. He retired from his military service in 1981. And it was during the early years of his service when he was stationed at Ellsworth Air Force Base in South Dakota that he met Tico. And they fell in love and ultimately married in 1964. And to that union were born their three children. Family was important to Bill. And so important was it that he made a determination that, uh, that he kept. And that was that he never would accept a military assignment that would have separated him from Tico and from their children. And he had opportunities to do that. But he always turned them down because he wanted to be there for his family. Bill had a second career uh, after he retired from the Air Force. From 1981 to 2002, Bill was an insurance agent with Allstate Insurance. And uh, the family said that um, all of those folks who had Bill as their agent knew that they were indeed in good hands. Bill loved spending time with family and friends away from the city especially out in the mountains of Colorado. Now that time might have been spent in an RV uh, or it was time spent on the back of one of his many motorcycles. And perhaps you saw some of the pictures out there of that. And he enjoyed those trips for a variety of reasons, but one of them was, how, <clears throat> excuse me, how the mountains put him in awe of the one who created them. And that was one of the reasons that he loved being in the mountains. And Bill was known to say on those trips, how can anyone come to the mountains and then go away not believing in God? And Bill didn't just use his motorcycle for uh, joy riding and for trips into the mountains. He also rode in many funeral processions with the Patriot Guard riders. And I'm sure you saw uh, some of his brothers and sisters in that fine organization uh, outside. They are here today uh, and they are doing as their motto says, standing for those who stood for us. But you know, there's one more passion that motivated and excited Bill. And I want to talk about that in just a moment. But first, let's sing a couple more songs together. 645. These songs, incidentally, that we're singing today were, uh, were among Bill's favorites. 645.
71. As I sat with this delightful family on Sunday and talked about Bill and talked about the service today, one of the things that was mentioned uh, as much or more than anything else was Bill's love for God and his passion for Bible study, for spending time in the Word of God. And one of their favorite objects is the Bible that Bill used for his studying. And I'm assuming that's the one that's on the table in the back. So you saw that, I'm sure, when you came in. It is uh, worn out. Uh, it's ragged. Uh, I think the word tattered was the word that someone used on Sunday to describe it. And it... It tells you something about Bill. It tells you about how much time he spent with God in his word. And I'm honored today that they have allowed me to borrow uh, Bill's New Testament uh, that I'll be reading from today and using today. Uh, this is the New Testament that Bill would take with him whenever he would go to visit those that were sick, those that were uh, homebound or shut in at their homes. Uh, he would often uh, take uh, the Lord's Supper on Sundays to those that were uh, sick and otherwise couldn't uh, assemble with the rest of the church. And he would take some time on Sunday afternoon to go and visit those folks. And, and he took this New Testament with him and used it and read it and spent that special time with brothers and sisters in Christ. And at one point in our conversation on Sunday, I asked if Bill had any favorite 
Bible passages or if there were any passages of Scripture that made them think about Bill. And I think it was Kenny that mentioned Romans chapter 1, verse number 16. And I uh, looked it up in Bill's New Testament, and sure enough, it's underlined there. And I'd like to read it for you. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. We're going to talk about verse 16 in just a moment, but I want to back up and notice verses 14 and 15 as well. Because I think when you look at those three verses, we get a pretty good description of Bill, uh, of who he was, and what was important to him. And verse 14, Paul the Apostle writes these words, I am debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. Now the reference to barbarians there is, is a term that was simply used at that time to refer to those that were not of, of Greek descent. So he basically says, I, 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 am, I am in debt, I'm a debtor, both to Greeks and non-Greeks. So that pretty much covers everybody, doesn't it? And Paul felt that way with regard to the gospel. And I believe Bill felt that same sense of obligation, that sense of responsibility to others. He certainly felt it toward his family as he provided for them both materially and, and spiritually. But he felt that sense of obligation or sense of responsibility toward others as well. His Christian family, his church family. We mentioned earlier his many visits to those that were that were sick or in the hospital, his words of encouragement that, that, uh, that I was privileged to receive on many occasions. He felt a sense of obligation to the lost as well, to those that, that, that don't know Jesus. As a matter of fact, he spent a number of years involved in a program called Friends Speak. And it's a program that uses... Uh, the Bible, to teach English as a second language. And it serves two purposes. One, that purpose of helping people who don't know the English language to learn it. Uh, but its secondary purpose, Bill might say the primary purpose, is to expose people to the gospel of Jesus Christ. To help people to see what's been done for them in the person of Jesus. And there are people in this assembly today who came to know the Lord and obey the gospel because of Bill and because he felt a sense of obligation, a sense of responsibility to share with others what he had come to enjoy in his own life and in his own heart. And so when I read Romans 1.14 where Paul says, I am a debtor to others with regard to the gospel, I think of Bill too. I think he felt that sense of responsibility. Then in verse 15, Paul continues and he says, So, as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are in Rome also. He's writing to Romans. And so he says, because I feel this sense of obligation, this sense of responsibility, because of that, he says, I am ready to preach the gospel. Well, I think Bill was ready. He maintained a state of readiness. He prepared himself through his long hours of Bible study, through the application of that Bible study to his own life. He was ready to share the good news of Jesus with others. He was ready to show people the love of Christ in his life. And so if someone needed a visit, Bill was ready. If a sick person couldn't make it to worship on Sunday, and needed a visit, Bill was ready. If there was a lost person, someone who didn't know the Lord, and they wanted to know the Lord, Bill was ready. And it didn't matter the nature of the task. He was always ready to show the love of Christ and share the gospel of Christ. Because it wasn't about him. It was about Jesus. And then, verse 16. 
Paul says, I'm not ashamed. Bill had firm and unwavering beliefs about God and about his word. But one of the things that was special about Bill was that he had the personality that allowed him to stand firmly on those beliefs without coming across as mean-spirited. He told his children often, remember that you're a Christian, which tells me that Bill wanted them to be unashamed of the gospel too. So when I think about this passage, these three verses, I think what described Paul, how he described himself, describes Bill. I'm a debtor. I feel a sense of obligation and responsibility to my fellow man. I am ready to fulfill that responsibility and obligation. And I am unashamed. I will stand firmly for God and for his word but do it with love and kindness and compassion. And see, what undergirded everything about Bill, who he was and what he did, was his love for God and his anticipation of one day going to be with him. And it was that. His devotion to God, his longing for heaven, that's what put him in his lazy boy on Sunday afternoons studying his Bible. That's what sent him to hospitals and homes to visit others. That's what made him patient with others. And I remember on Sunday as we were visiting that it's one of the things that, that Tico said several times was that she remembers his patience. It's what gave him his pleasant demeanor, his ready smile and accompanying joke what made him a good provider. It's what made him marvel at the beauty of God's creation. And it's what made him, it's what enabled rather Tico to say about him. And I wrote this down as soon as she said it on Sunday and I don't even know if she remembers saying it because it was almost just a passing statement. But she said everything is a good memory. And everything is a good memory because of Bill's devotion to his Lord. Let's pray together. Holy Father, we praise and thank you for blessing our lives through Bill Stafford. We're grateful for all that you have allowed and enabled him to be. We're grateful for the legacy that he leaves behind in his good family. We pray you'd bless them today, especially Tico and their children. Bless them as they carry on with their lives, bolstered by their own faith, their own hope, their own love. Traits that Bill taught them and lived in their presence. And may we all learn from his example as he learned from your word to be debtors, to be ready, to be unashamed. Through Jesus we pray. Amen. Bill and Kenny, you want to say a few words? So number one, thank you for coming. Um, isn't it just like the government to make you have a funeral Monday through Friday so not everybody gets to join in? But what I would tell you is, is this, those that came, this is what he would have wanted. This is, this is dad. Dad was extremely humble. Dad was extremely somewhat private, right? And so he would have loved to have this type of crowd to share his memories. Um, 
I have a uh, presentation that'll be uh, coming up here shortly, and so what I'm going to do is kind of walk through. Do I need to turn you on? There we go. I'm going to walk through uh, our memories, and specifically my memories of my dad. And why I want to do this is I, I would rather us remember the good times um, and remember the laughs and remember the smiles um, because that's who dad was. And so I'm going to share some stories, so I'm going to give you permission to, to laugh. And I'm going to give you permission to laugh at us. Because some of this is downright funny. Okay? Um, but I'm going to give it to you in the lens of a little boy. Now the funny story about this particular picture, and this is me, Dad and I were looking at this picture, and he was famous for his one-liner. And as he looked at the picture, he looked at me and he goes, golly, son, what happened? <laughs> so I'm like, well, mom cooks good, so. But that's where the story starts. So this is my father. My father was a loving man. He grew up in a, a, a different time and had different experiences. And so those experiences, you would say that where I would tell you what dad got from that is he would never outwardly tell you I love you. And so that's, as we talked about it as kids, we rarely heard dad say I love you. But it wasn't because he didn't love us. We knew he loved us through all of his actions. Every single action that he, that he did for us kids that was out of love. And there's a story here in a little bit and I'll tell you why I know that those were emotions were true, okay? But what I will tell you is that dad was a hard worker. He worked two to three jobs and that was with serving in the military and he was always a great provider. And that's what I remember about dad. I remember about his one-liners and some of you have, may have heard some of those one-liners. If you ask dad in passing, hey, how are you doing today, Bill? He generally would say, well, you know what? I don't know, I'd have to get back to you on that, right? And so this is dad at about three months old, Columbus, Indiana. He was a very, very cute kid. And I'm going to walk around so I can see some. Oh, I didn't see this. So, Eddie, that's nice. So this is at, uh, him at three months old. Very cute kid. Um, and this is him at three years old. Now, if you look at the frown on his face, this was daddy. He was upset. He was telling me at the, at the time that he was, upset, he was upset that he had to put a coat on and then he had to take a picture. And so this was a little bit of his pouting. And then this was an attempt of my grandmother and grandfather to make a good boy out of Bill Stafford. And so he joined the Cub Scouts, or, or the Boy Scouts rather, um, but I don't know if that was so much his choosing or his parents choosing. Because this was who we knew as dad. Dad was always the cool guy, right? And dad was somewhat James Deanish, if you will. He always did a little things a little bit different. He always was in a little bit of trouble. At this time, what I will tell you about my father is he loved racing, loved every bit about it. And so what he would do is he would go every waking minute that he could to the racetrack, specifically the dirt track. And if you've never been to the Devil's Bowl in Mesquite, that's where he lived most of his younger years. And he would literally go find a job there at the Devil's Bowl or at the racetrack, work the ticket counter so he could get in free to see a free race. And that was just him. He loved the sounds. He loved the smell. He loved everything about racing. Now, this was my dad. That's me in 1974. Eddie was right. Dad was uh, always slow to hinder, extremely patient. That picture is my dad. We never, ever knew that he didn't love us, ever. 
This was also to my dad. So dad had some hard times in remembering either what shoe or which shoes he should wear, so he just wore both sometimes. And so one's a laced up shoe, and I don't know if you could tell for the picture, and the other one's just a slip on. And so we would give him a hard time about these things. And some of you may or may not know he had Alzheimer's too. And so there were times where mom would go ask him, hey, Bill, would you go into the garage and grab some things out of the garage for me? And so dad would say, yes, ma'am. And he would go to the garage and he would come back. And this one particular time I was sitting on the couch and he'd come back and whisper. And he's like, Kenny, what did mama tell me to get? And I said, well, she asked you for this. Oh, yeah, that's right. So he would go back to the garage, and he would come back a minute later. What was that I was supposed to get? And that's why I would tell him again, right? And so this was the Alzheimer's coming in. So the third time he came back, had the things in hand, so I'm like, okay, he's got it. And so him, always being the jokester, he would come to me and he'd just say, don't tell anybody that I'm losing my mind. I'm like, (laughs) okay. So this is dad. Um, This particular photo is of a video and took a snapshot. And the reason why I took a snapshot of this particular picture, we as kids always love torturing our parents. And this is one of our fun ways of doing it. And what you don't know about my dad is dad always had a hard time reading cards. Even though he didn't outwardly tell you, I love you, he was extremely an emotional person inside. Okay, And so what we would do, knowing this, we would get the hammiest, loviest cards and make them read it out loud to the rest of the group that was celebrating a birthday or Father's Day. And how Dad would start out was he'd open the card, he would read it silently, he would close the card and say, thank you. And we said, no, 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 you've got to read the card. And he's like, no, no, it was a great card. What's my gift? And I said, no, no, you got to read the card. So he would start reading the card. And so he would get literally two words, and this is the sound he'd make. (laughs) Okay, so let's go on. And so we would torture him by having to read this card, and he hated it, but he also loved it too because he knew we loved him, and at that point, seeing all the emotions and the tears coming out, we knew he loved us. Now, this is a picture of my mom and dad, and if you didn't know, mom had her own saloon um, one day, and, they, uh, and it was called Tico's Place, and apparently dad, after getting uh, done at a hard day's work at the Battle of Gettysburg, he'd come and meet mom at that saloon. But this is who mom and dad were, and this is a picture that they had taken in Silverton, Colorado at one of those old-time uh, photo shops. And so the individual that runs uh, that shop and some other individuals from Silverton, we still have relationships with today, but this was just a fun time. And then this is also, Dad, this is at Sturgis, so always hamming it up. Um, But I thought was just a great picture of his personality. And then this is also my dad. So Dad loved motorcycles, and in fact, at one point, he had five different Harleys in the garage, and we were the benefactors as kids having those Harleys because we made a lot of great memories. And those memories we still hold today, we talked about them, and specifically recently we were just going through stories about how dad's love became our love and his love became our memories. So this is another picture of dad. Later in years you'll notice that he's getting a little bit grayer, but still proud of his Harley Davidson. This is a picture in Mena, Arkansas, um, at a state park called Queen Wilhelmina State Park. If you've ever been there, please go. It's a beautiful place. And this is one of his first loves on one of his best loves. His wife of 57 years and one of his favorite bikes. And they made many miles of memories. And then this one rings true, so uh, dad was also particular to uh, the Patriot Guard that you see out front, and so when he retired, 
Uh, Dad had purchased this bike. This was a Boss Haas. Uh, it has a short block Corvette engine mounted on a bike frame, and he painted it as the American flag. And what was pointing about this bike was that he was the lead bike in the Patriot Guard as he accompanied veterans either to the National Cemetery or picking them up from DFW to a funeral home. And so he took pride and joy in that. And there was a couple out there that I was talking to this morning that remembered Dad and were surprised that they saw Dad here today. This is Mom and Dad on top of Engineers Pass. I will tell you this particular location is exactly where Eddie was talking about. This was the one location that Dad always enjoyed going to because he saw the beauty of God's wonder. And this is where he would walk away saying, if you walk away from this and don't believe there's a God, I just don't understand it. Now, if you notice the tube socks, those were stylish back in the 1980s. This is our first trek uh, to Colorado in 1983. Kind of a funny story here. We're in this station wagon, and it was a white station wagon. If you'd notice the sides, it's a little bit darker. It did have wood paneling, and so we were that family. Um, <laughs> And one of our first trips, and I can't remember if we were going through uh, our Trinidad or Durango, but uh, Dad had decided just to roll down the windows. And you hear my brother in the back seat, or we were in the back seat, and my brother was inquisitive. He was like, Dad, what is that smell? And Dad said, Son, that's fresh air. <laughs> and so we then learned uh, the beauty of Colorado. This was also uh, a part of our life. So dad always bought things that were family oriented. So whether it were the motorcycles, this 34 uh, foot RV. The funny story about this RV was that dad um, was in the bathroom and he was brushing his teeth. And he says, mama, what kind of toothpaste did you buy? He goes, this is the worst tasting toothpaste I've ever had. So she'd walk back there and then, I'm gonna be mama, okay? So she's like, she looks at what dad had in his hand. He's like, Bill, that's not toothpaste. That's desitin, that's diaper rash cream. <laughs> and so dad was brushing his teeth with desitin. <laughs> now, I want you to remember that story because I'm gonna get back to it here in just a second. So remember the desitin. <laughs> then Mariah, he bought a ski boat. And so we had a ski boat and we enjoyed that ski boat and there was one place that he always enjoyed and it was over at Eagle Mountain Lake and there was this marina that had a restaurant right in the marina and it was Harbor One and so he just enjoyed it. So this was one of our first treks uh, and outings and voyages on a brand new boat and so we were coming into the marina and mom's in her life vest and the kids were there and all of a sudden we're kind of going in at a good pace, and then all of a sudden the boat starts doing this, and now we're going sideways into the marina, and Dad is not figuring out how to drive a boat. And so it's a little bit awkward, and all of a sudden you see Mom trying to lift her leg over the uh, uh, side of the boat, flip-flop on one little toe, and saying, Bill, it's cricket, it's cricket. <laughs> and so once we finally got docked, I guarantee you that all those folks at Harbor One in the restaurant was wondering what cricket meant, but what mom was trying to say is, Dad, you're going into the dock crooked, but in Japanese, it's cricket, okay? <laughs> so some really good memories there. And then here's where I wanted to kind of take you down the path of uh, some recent stories, okay? So um, January 13th at 6.12 in the morning, I was at home with mama. My brother and my sister stayed with dad. He was at that point on comfort care and so uh, they made him extremely comfortable and was just allowing him to pass peacefully. And at 6.12 in the morning, I woke up to a bang in the room that I was staying in. And so I woke up, looked around the room, there was nothing in the room and so I looked at my phone just to see if there was any text messages from dad about how dad was doing and I didn't see any. And so I texted my brother at 612 uh, and said, hey, any updates? 
And so 13 minutes later, at 625, Bill said, Dad just passed. Now, I don't know about you, and I'm, I'm not going to tell you what I think, but I want to believe that that bang was Dad waking me up and telling me goodbye. A couple of days later, in the morning, I'm brushing my teeth, and I'm in Dad's bathroom. And I open the drawer, and I reach in for toothpaste, and guess what I pulled out? A tube of Destin. And I'm like, now that's funny, Daddy. <laughs> and I want to believe Dad just put it in my reach so that I could have that memory. Okay? And a few days later, I make it back to Arizona, and that's where I'm living now. And as Amy, I get back to Amy, and we're reminiscing through all the pictures that we had, at least of Dad and Mom and the family back in the day. And so it was time to go to bed, and so I piled up all these pictures, and I put them in one single pile, and I went to bed. And the next morning I wake up, and I'm going to get a cup of coffee, and this picture is sitting on the corner of the counter, and the pile of pictures were in the middle of the counter. Now, I don't know, and nor I, I'm going to say that I just want to believe that that was Dad. And the story behind this picture is just special to me and Dad, and so I'll keep it that way, but I just want to think and believe that Dad was telling me goodbye and telling me that it was going to be okay and telling me that he's okay. This This is my daddy. My daddy was a good man. He was a good Christian. He was a great soldier. He was a great husband. He was definitely a great father. And the reason why is because he was my daddy. Thank you, Kenny. That was uh, lots of good memories. Um, I'm a very private person. Uh, I don't do Facebook. I don't do anything. I, uh, I don't share a lot with a lot of people. If you're in my circle, it's a pretty tight circle, so uh, I'm out of my element up here. But I do want to share some stories because they're funny. And Dad would like it. Kenny had mentioned the uh, love for Colorado that Dad had and uh, now I have. And uh, I remember one of the first times we were in Colorado and we rented some Jeeps and this was in the probably the 80s and the idea was to take the Jeeps up and into the mountains and uh, pretty treacherous up there at times and you know 500 foot drop-offs and this was our first venture and and uh, I was 16 following dad in the Jeep and, and mom mom was not liking it she wasn't having it and uh, she was getting upset to the point where she's she was trying to get dad's attention and trying to get him to turn around. So she said, Bill, we shouldn't do this. We are Christians. Christians shouldn't do this. And you know, Dad, we're all bouncing around and, and Dad's listening to her and, 
And uh, she goes, okay, that's it. Sunday, we go forward <laughs> to confess our sins. And uh, so we get to the top of Engineer, and uh, Engineer pass that same picture. And uh, we get out of the Jeeps, and everything's kind of calming down. And Dad looks at me and goes, well, you got plans? Plans? He goes, yeah. Sunday. Because we can't be late. We've got to go confess. <laughs> I said, I'll make it a point, Dad. Another story that came to mind, uh, given Dad's love for motorcycles, when, uh, when he first was wanting to start up that, that passion again for motorcycles that he had when he was a kid, he pulled me aside and he says, now I need you to do me a favor. And I said, okay, Dad, what's up? He says, well, I need, to talk to you. I need you to talk to your mom. Okay, why? Well, I want to get a bike. Okay, what do I have to do with it? You go tell your mom I want to get a bike. I said, well, you go tell her. It's your wife. No, she won't listen to me. If you go in there and tell her how much of a good time we're going to have once we get bikes, she'll listen to you. Okay, Dad. So we're in the living room. And he's over there trying to give me the high sign, like, all right, this is a good opportunity to do it. And uh, I'm looking at him, and he's giving me the look, and, hey, Mom, uh, what do you think? Uh, be nice for all of us to have motorcycles? No. <laughs> Too dangerous. I don't like. And uh, so then, okay, I was leaving it alone. Dad's over there doing this, you know. Do it again. Ultimately, I brought mom around, and, and uh, one bike led to another and led to another, and, you know, as, as they say, the rest is history. Um, one time we were in Arkansas, and uh, I always had an epiphany for go-fast bikes, the ninjas and the super bikes and all that, and dad was always on his cruiser. And uh, we were at Mina, as, as you saw the picture, at the State Lodge, and we were out riding, and uh, that was the whole idea, is just to get up early, eat breakfast, go ride, see all the scenery, God's creations. And uh, I was in front, and I was going around the mountain on the twisty turns and playing speed racer. And uh, I, I got a little bit, uh, I was out of my debt. I came around way too fast in the corner, ended up going, uh, blindly into the other lane of traffic around the mountain, scared myself to death. And I, to the point where I had to pull over and catch my breath. And I'm sure I was as white as a sheet. A few minutes later, I can hear Dad's Harley pulling up. Bup, 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 bup. He pulls up. He looks at me, turns off the bike. You just scared the crap out of yourself, didn't you? I said, yeah. You want to knock that off? I'm on vacation. <laughs> I hear you, Dad. Uh, so I want to, in those memories, share with you, whether it was a day trip or an overnight trip, we were in San Antonio, Austin, Fredericksburg, Lukenbach. Marble Falls, Bandera, Beavers Bend, Oklahoma, Broken Bow, Mean, Arkansas, Durango, Colorado, Silverton, Colorado, Uray, Santa Fe, New Mexico, Sturgis in South Dakota. So many memories. Countless Saturday trips to Possum Kingdom and Granbury, Glen Rose, and Mineral Wells. That's that's Dad. Now, to some of you, Bill Stafford was a teacher, a neighbor, an insurance agent, a recruiter, 
a riding buddy, or a friend. To me, he was my dad. And I'm going to share this one last story. that was hidden from me for years until I had my own kids. And then for some reason, it just popped into my head. We were stationed in Kadena, and that's a, in Okinawa at the base. And I remember as a little kid, I was four or five years old. And uh, the back of the house that we had had a cinder block wall. I don't know, maybe waist high, chest high, I don't remember. And my dad would pick me up and he'd put me on that cinder block wall. And he said, Billy, watch that sun. It's going to disappear into the ocean. And we're looking over the Pacific. And I remember Daddy holding me while I was sitting on that wall. <laughs> and that sun would disappear into the ocean. And we did that I don't know how many times. Not until I had kids. And then I realized I was watching the sunset with my daddy. And it took me out there a lot to do that. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Kenny and Bill, for sharing memories and sharing your hearts with us. We're going to sing one more song, and then <clears throat> I'll have some, uh, some uh, final remarks and instructions. And this will be number 247. 247. This is a, a song that Bill would um, sing, hum, perhaps whistle, uh, especially with his grandkids, Wyatt and Will. 247. <clears throat> here we are, but straying pilgrims here, our path is often dim, but to cheer us. directors will uh, will come down and uh, and open the casket and everyone will uh, will pass by to pay their final respects 
And uh, at, at their suggestion, we're going to encourage everyone. I know sometimes as we come down to do that, we'll stop and visit with the family first. Uh, we're going to encourage you, if you don't mind, to just come on by and, and uh, pay your respects as you pass by uh, because we're going to have plenty of time uh, after that for everyone to visit with the family. Uh, we have a special time that we have to be at the uh, National Cemetery, and so that determines when we leave here. Uh, and we'll need to leave here right at noon. Uh, and so we're going to have quite a bit of time to just stay in here and visit together. Uh, and uh, you, can, uh, you can have that special time with the family then. And so we do thank you for coming. And so let us uh, conclude the service, or at least this part of it, uh, with prayer together. Holy Father, thank you for allowing us to, uh, to walk down memory lane we thank you for, um, for Bill's life, for the tremendous impact that he has had on so many people, especially his own family. We're thankful for that example uh, that he set. We're thankful uh, that, uh, that his life uh, continues to be a blessing uh, to the lives of his children and grandchildren. And we're thankful for the impact for good that he had through so many ventures in his life, his military service, his, uh, his work uh, in insurance, his work in the church, um, all of those things are a testament uh, to the sterling character of Bill Stafford. We thank you for allowing us to know him. And we pray, Father, that you would bring us once more uh, into his presence in that great day of reunion that we long for. Through Jesus we pray, amen.